But there's also extreme environments on Earth. This is Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone. Absolutely gorgeous photograph of a hydrothermal spring. Cold temperatures, this is Lake Louise in Canada. Dry environments and these deep hydrothermal vents, these black smokers that have been making the news a lot. Absolutely fantastic examples of these extreme environments where people imagine it would be very hard for anything to be alive. And yet, there are things alive. These are the extremophiles. Extremophile, the file, the root of the word file means to love the environment. There are organisms that love the heat, thermophiles love acid environments, acidophiles, love alkaline environments, these are the alkalophiles, and love salt, these are the halophiles. You know, what's interesting about extremophiles is that there's a difference between being able to be tolerant to this environment and needing the environment. Anybody who's lived through Washington, D.C. in August is clearly heat tolerant. <laughs> We've all been through that. But the thermophiles absolutely require that heat. They can't survive without that heat. That's what makes this group so interesting. What do they have that's different under the hood that helps them to not only survive this environment, but thrive in it? The benefits of actually doing this kind of study are many. The first, obviously, just for understanding the biodiversity on Earth. There's life where we never thought that life was possible. So studying that on a fundamental level is something that is a benefit to all of us. But there's also a commercial application to these studies. Through the study of thermophiles, an enzyme was found, a piece of the molecular machinery that they were able to actually rip out of the cell and use as a molecular photocopier that can copy DNA. This is the basis for all of the gene sequencing technologies that you're seeing now in genetic studies are all based on what's called a polymerase chain reaction. This is copying done by this enzyme from a hypothermophile that works like a photocopier copying DNA. So there's a lot of commercial applications that can be done using these organisms. Another really interesting part, which is what I've spent a lot of my work looking at, is viewing extremophiles as simplified models of complicated systems. Now, in order for me to explain to you exactly what that means, I need to give you a bit of background. This is how we used to classify life. Group things together by things that looked the same. Plants look like plants, bacteria looks like bacteria. Group everything together by how it looks. So basically the theory was, if it looks like a duck, it's a duck. So if you've got something that you're not sure what it is, but it looks like bacteria, it's bacteria. <laughs> Then we had the gene sequencing revolution. They found out that when you started to take apart the DNA sequence and code it, it could be used as a molecular fingerprint. The same way that we use fingerprinting technology to identify people, you can use the genetic code to identify living organisms and actually group them together with what's similar. Well, it found out that some of these things that looked like a duck didn't quite quack like a duck. You looked at their genetic code, it didn't look the same. There were sections that were missing and sections that added on. But amazingly enough, it looked just like our proteins. So here's an interesting thing. It's not bacteria, it's not the duck. So what is it? The world got changed when this man, Carl Woese, decided that this should be called the group Archaea. They split life into three domains. Here's all of your bacteria. Here are you and me, plants and animals, and here's the archaea. These are cells that look like bacteria, but all of their molecular machinery inside is actually like yours and mine, not like bacteria. The interesting thing, the archaea are where most of the extremophiles are found. And in fact, the more extreme an environment gets, the hotter it gets, the colder it gets. The more of these archaea you find, and you get far fewer of the bacteria and the eukarya. So this is a really fascinating group of organisms. And in fact, they can be used as simplified models of DNA repair. This is a schematic just showing what happens if your DNA strand breaks. They have to use another copy of the DNA to use as a template, take some proteins to hold the two ends together, and then fill in the missing parts using the intact stretch of DNA. Well, this process in humans involves a huge number of proteins. 
and the dots here are telling us that we still haven't identified all of them. The interesting thing is, is that in the archaea, there are far fewer, and it just does exactly the same thing. So if we can figure out how this process works in the stripped down model, we can then translate that up into how it works in our cells. Now, of course, fixing broken DNA is of utmost importance for our survival, and including things like human cancers. You'll notice in this repair system, they have the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. These are the genes that have been associated with breast cancer, if there are mutations in these genes. So understanding these systems is of vital importance. The other interesting thing about working with extremophiles is they can be used for models of what life could be like elsewhere in the universe. I specifically focus on the halophiles. These are your salt-loving organisms. This is one of the solar salt terms. You can see evaporated ponds where you can actually mine salt. This is the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Right through the middle there is where they have a dam shutting off the two sides of the Great Lake. And this is another salt lake in Namibia. The one thing you'll notice is in common to all three of these pictures is the pink color. The pink is actually the halophiles, tiny microbes inside the water that love that salt water that are turning the lakes pink. The interesting thing is, is that salt environments are not unique to Earth. They've been found on Mars. So here's some data that was published in Science in 2004 from the Mars Exploration Rovers that are still in operation to find all the odds. Here is the Dead Sea with increasing salt concentration. You can see the Dead Sea here, high salt concentration. This is the samples that they found on Mars. These are high salt environments. These are environments that actually aren't quite as salty as what we have on Earth. So figuring out how life lives in these high salt environments on Earth gives us a good pointer of what we'd be looking for if we went back to that same place and started to look for life on Mars. What's interesting about halophiles is they can survive trapped inside of salt crystals for huge amounts of time. Currently, nobody's really quite sure, but there has been discussions about the fact that they could be trapped inside salt crystals for thousands, possibly millions of years. Pretty controversial right now still. But what we do know is that here's regular table salt crystal, and here's the same salts with halophiles inside, giving it that pink color. And in fact, you can see this being sold as uh, souvenirs, pink rock salt, including this lamp that actually belongs to a friend of mine. So it was given to her because it was advertised as being, you know, reducing the amount of radiation. It turns out that's actually right. But it's not the salt, it's the pink bugs living inside her lamp. <coughs> Halophiles have also been used as an art form. This is actually a sculpture installation that was put into the Great Salt Lake in 1970 called Spiral Jetty. This is an aerial view looking down, and you can see how somebody manipulated the pink color of the halophiles in the water to swirl around, and you can see this wonderful swirl from above. I think it's underwater. Is it underwater now? Wouldn't be surprised. A couple of other fun facts about halophiles. This is where we get our term red herring. It's from the salt that was actually used to preserve the fish. When the, when the salt had halophiles inside, it actually would spoil the fish. And also, Red Sea. It's because of the organisms found in the water. 